So our next speaker is Martin Helwig from Bonn. Okay. Uh, the title of the program says, has reform of banking regulation made the financial system safer? A more appropriate title is, has the financial system become safe? Safer is not the same as safe. It probably has become safer, but definitely not safe. Uh, my own <coughs> interpretation of all this, of what we've had, corresponds to, well, suppose we have a truck exploding in a tunnel at 150 kilometers per hour. After that, you get a huge discussion about, well, these things should not happen. We must do something about speed limits for trucks with explosive in tunnels. <laughs> Let's lower the speed limit to 80 kilometers. Ah, but this will raise the cost of transportation and will reduce the division of labor and will harm economic growth. So after all this has been considered, the speed limit for trucks is lowered to 140 kilometers per hour and in addition, since we need to uh, show that we are active, we also impose a limit on the gas consumption of SUVs. After all, everybody knows that SUVs burning too much gasoline bears important risks for explosives in tunnels. At some point last year, at a conference of central bankers, I was asked, why are you so unhappy about the things that have been done since uh, 2008? And I, this was a former central banker. I responded, suppose that all the regulatory reforms that we've had have been in place as of 2000. Would the financial crisis have been avoided? Another central banker who was sitting there said, no. So that, that's basically my talk. I just explained a little bit further. And the point of my talk is to reflect on the nature of the political discussion, also academic discussion, that we've had since 2008. So here is a story. In October of 2008, the German bank who bought real estate was bailed out with public money. Any legal modes of intervention, such as insolvency procedures or analogous procedures under the law on banking regulation, were deemed to involve systemic risk. So the government went to the parliament and said, we need to pass a law that allows us to do this. And within five days, the law was passed, and they were bailed out. The bailout even affected equity holders. In the end, equity holders got one euro thirty for their shares. Quite remarkable. The insolvent company that has to be bailed out by the government and equity holders still gets something. So then, and here is one of the really strange features. As of March 2009, the ministries in charge begin to work on a bank restructuring law. They take 15 months to disagree with each other. And then they introduce a bill which documents the disagreement, first into the government, and the government then into the Bundestag. We will never again be in such a situation as we were in October 28. At the hearings in the Bundestag, uh, I argued the law will not work. Two months later, the law was passed anyway. One of the deputies told me, we have to pass it, because otherwise the institutions that were created in October 28 would go out of existence on December 31st. 
In that same month of December 2010, uh, a, a committee that was to design strategies for the government's exiting from its crisis-induced participation in banks suggested one way of exiting is to wind down Hupo real estate. There's excess capacity in those markets, and therefore that's a sensible thing to do. And by the way, the uh, consulting firm's reports that you've received that advise you against this have very serious flaws. We sent a draft of this uh, report to the finance ministry. And this is the same ministry that promised the Bundestag if this law is passed, we'll never again be in such a situation as we were uh, in 28. And they told us, you've got to withdraw this recommendation. If we announce that we're going to wind down Hupo real estate, funding will break away. They have a lot of short-term debt and that will not be renewed. And we don't know what to do. And we have no legal, legal basis for doing anything and would have to go through the same procedure again as in October 28. So basically, this, you have legislation that's presented to the parliament, which says the problem that we've had in the past will never uh, appear again. And yet, it was a distance of four weeks between this letter and the uh, Bundestag decision on the law. Uh, they knew full well that it didn't solve the problem. A year later, they actually did change the law and allowed for bailout possibilities again. Uh, in substance, this was to resurrect the 2008 bailout law. Not, of course, to deal with restructuring problems, because those had all been solved by the law that they had passed, but because now we are dealing with recapitalizations in a systemic crisis, whatever the, the difference may be. A few months later, they needed to, be law to prolong that, and this time the reasoning was this is necessary because as yet there has been no European legislation on the subject. Why am I telling the story? Because it shows you how bureaucracies, in particular competing bureaucracies and governments, use blurbs to fool themselves and hopefully to fool the media without doing any proper analysis. They don't actually care to do proper analysis. Uh, by now, we have European legislation. The European legislation uh, has just as many holes as the German legislation had on the subject. I, I will get to that as I go along. Why? Well, actually, this is an a key point. The problem that the finance ministry told us they wouldn't be able to solve if we say we want to wind down HRE, liquidity is going to disappear. That problem is completely ignored in the European legislation. Nowhere in the European directive or in the re re regulation on the single resolution mechanism do we have any mention of the fact that if you put a bank into such a procedure, uh, it won't be up and running again on the following Monday. And you have to provide liquidity <coughs> to allow for a slow winding down or a slow restructuring, slow reorganization. Uh, this problem is still with us, and I expect that if a bank uh, gets into trouble again, the governments again have to step in with taxpayer money. Why? In this particular case, and I mean, I've, I've raised the issue of interim funding in resolution uh, on many occasions, including uh, behind closed doors with people in the ministry. If you talk about that, you talk about hundreds of billions. 
the balance sheet of Deutsche Bank is, uh, well, used to be, now it's a bit reduced, used to be two trillion. And a lot of that is short term and needs to be renewed on an ongoing basis. Even Commerzbank, more than 600 billion. If you talk about those numbers, well, you need government guarantees to ensure that this funding is going on, or you need the government to take that over. Now, in the European context, those numbers are almost automatic, well, would almost automatically lead to fiscal union. So if you want to avoid talking about fiscal union, you don't want to talk about those numbers. And so one formulation that I've got on this with a person in responsibility, if necessary, this will be the task of the central bank. Never mind that the central bank should not be funding banks that might be insolvent. But here, the political authorities quite consciously avoid dealing with the real problem because dealing with the real problem would require institutional change that they don't want to have. More generally, if you want to understand the logic of the dynamics, it's very simple. The institutions and their creditors love bailouts and don't like resolution. So uh, they've been part of the lobby to make these, this legislation at the national and at the European level ineffective. The governments want to maintain banks, German public banks, the Cajas in Spain, and we could go into uh, other countries as well. Uh, to quote a bank robber in response to a journalist, banks are where the money is. So you don't want to wind down banks. You want to maintain them, uh, hopefully uh, with help from someone. A more interesting feature that we have nowadays is also governments love to protect creditors. Many creditors are, in fact, institutional investors. If you look at the list of investors in Hypo real estate debt, the established churches, public television uh, systems, lots of municipalities. Of course, you also have Deutsche Bank and Allianz, and you have a few pension funds. You can see that if you have those institutions in there, not bailing them out might get you into a systemic crisis of uh, other dimensions. More generally, the power of institutional investors is a major concern uh, in these areas. On the particular issue of restructuring, the legal community has played a very strange role. All the people who were specialized on insolvency law made clear that they thought that any bank restructuring law must be like an insolvency law. Even though one reason for uh, wanting to have this new law was because insolvency law was deemed to, uh, in insolvency procedures or insolvency-like procedures were deemed to generate systemic risks. So domino effects and things like that. Most importantly, actually, under German insolvency law, you get an immediate freeze on all activities in the interest of protecting creditors. Well, from the perspective of that particular legal community, there is a constitutional right of creditors to be protected. And there is a constitutional right of owners not to have government intervention prior to an insolvency. Whereas the whole point about a bank restructuring law 
with a view to avoiding systemic risk would be uh, to do this before insolvency law sets in, use a restructuring in order to minimize the systemic uh, for them. Uh, I, I was quite surprised, and, and I think that this is an issue to take into account, to what extent, in this case, a particular legal community with sort of well-defined and narrow and not necessarily problem-oriented uh, ideas was able to influence the legislative process. If you ask, why don't we make progress? At the supranational level, we don't really have any workable discourse. And we have a lack of legitimacy from a political perspective, elites versus the public. Uh, this slide is actually also a comment or, or an addition to Hans Werner Sinn's talk. Uh, one feature of n not having solved the crisis in the Euro context has been that we have had no workable discourse about what to do. And moreover, just as in the, bank, in the case of the Bank Restructuring Act, many of the participants never sat down and thought, what's the problem and what are sustainable strategies to dealing with the problem? and uh, bargaining on the basis of that. So what have we had by way of reforms? Most significant legal change Basel III, which in my view should be called Basel 2.01, because it's really built on the same principles as ba uh, Basel II. The major features are not changed. So what does Basel III bring? Well, no change in the model-based approach to <coughs> risk weighting. If you read of a bank saying we have equity amounting to 11%, that's not 11% of total assets, but 11% of what's called risk-weighted assets. And banks engage in something that they call risk weight management. And whereas the ratio of required equity to risk weighted assets has tripled after, sort of, with Basel III, a lot of the increase has been obtained by what they call optimization of risk weight management. Now, you might say risks are things that we measure and things that we don't manage. Well, banks, in, in, in the most critical parts of the system, banks are given the right to use their own quantitative models to determine how much equity uh, they must have uh, to back their assets. And for some reason or other, there are lots of risks that are not in the models. Some of that due to incompetence, maybe a fundamental inability to actually see and measure these risks. But in the crisis, many banks became insolvent from risks that had received zero risk weights in their models before. Now, uh, in order to counter that, we have what's called a leverage ratio. Actually, it's the inverse of the leverage ratio, but you can't do anything about wrong language. <laughs> Equity must be 3% of total assets, so that's not risk-weighted. 3%, that's basically what Lehman Brothers had in the last balance sheet before they declared bankruptcy. <clears throat> Putting it differently, that's 97% borrowing. To understand a little bit about the crisis, uh, as of 98, among the 20 
largest European banks. Only one or two had equity below 4% of total assets. And those two actually had to be bailed out in the crisis. Uh, by 2007, among the largest European banks, only one or two had equity above 4% of total assets. Deutsche Bank or UBS had something like 1.8%. Uh, leverage has risen dramatically, and that increase in leverage was a major element in the crisis. So we have other reforms in Basel, a so-called liquidity coverage ratio, which is still not being implemented. The idea is that each bank must be able to show that it can fulfill payment obligations arising over the next 30 days with the liquid assets that it has. What are liquid assets? Cash. Except, but cash doesn't provide you with a return. So the discussion here has been governed by what I call the ABC principle, anything but cash. I'll get back to that. There is also a maturity matching uh, rule called net stable funding ratio, which still has to be introduced, and I doubt whether it ever will. Ah, and then here come the gasoline, the, the, the limits on gasoline consumption for SUVs. We have new organizations. European Banking Authority, European Insurance and Organizational Pensions Authority, European Securities Markets Authority, European Systemic Risk Board, and now the Single Supervisory Mechanism. All this because the European Commission knew that like anything else that goes wrong, the crisis was due to a lack of European integration. We have new rules for hedge funds because politicians who don't like hedge funds, like the German finance minister, knew that the crisis must be due to hedge funds. A prohibition of short sales, same thing. And we have an enormous waste of energy in the discussion on the financial transactions tax. It's, of course, a pet project of the political left like gasoline consumption for SUVs, I mean, limiting that. But stock market speculation has had nothing to do with the crisis. We have had some improvements in recovery and re resolution, but we're still not, uh, we still haven't avoided too big to fail. I'll explain that in a minute. We have had a fair amount of discussion and some measures on structure, size limits, and in particular separation of commercial and investment banking. Much of that is based on nostalgia and illusions, and it's in the process of either not being implemented anyway, that's the European case, or being undone, uh, that's the US case. So why all of that? Well, we have something that I call the Iraq effect, after September 11th, Cheney and Rumsfeld knew that Iraq was a center of terrorism and must have been the culprit. Never mind not going after Al-Qaeda. Iraq was a real thing. I've given a few examples here that I've already discussed. The industry, crisis, what crisis? They love equity. They, 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 love shareholder value, return on equity, and all of those things are harmed by uh, equity requirements. Political interest, national champions. The Cypriot crisis had a lot to do with the Cypriot government using the banking sector by way of industrial policy to get uh, economic activity going. 
outsized financial systems in the UK, the Netherlands, Ireland, Iceland, all have to do with that. On Wednesday, I was at a dinner where some from, one from the UK declared, the crisis is over. We want to go for further expansion of the city. And actually, the uh, governor uh, of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, in a speech for the 125th anniversary of uh, the Financial Times, declared quite explicitly there are no limits to the size of the London financial sector. This must be uh, the global, global center, sort of the center for global finance. Mind you, this is the institution that's in charge of prudential supervision. Trade-offs. From the perspective of politicians, I already mentioned banks are where the money is, and I mentioned the issue of creditor protection. Now, why, why do they get through with this? Well, we don't have much of a conceptual basis for even talking about the crisis. Most countries, including this one, have not had an analysis of the crisis and its causes. Two exceptions, Iceland, and they've actually done something. In the US, the financial crisis inquiry report is wonderful, except it was published after the reform law, the Dodd-Frank Act, was passed and did not serve as an input into that. The media and parliaments find all the stuff that we would, would be talking about here much too abstract. I was at one uh, panel discussion in Berlin a few years ago. Casino capitalism or economic necessity? What's the role of financial innovation? You had two deputies, one from the right, one from the left, plus a top banker, plus me. After a lot of populism from the politicians, the top banker says, well, in the 80s, I listened to lectures from Professor Helwig, very abstract, principal agent theory, moral hazard. Couldn't make any sense of them. Then I went into business, and you know, we were rewarded by our contributions to return on equity. And the entire institution was run to maximize shareholder value. How do you raise return on equity? Well, you borrow. So all of our banks have expanded vastly by borrowing a lot on the equity that we had. So I thought, this, this is great. Here you have a top banker uh, admitting to having created risks on the basis uh, of and, and having had inordinate borrowing on the basis of flawed incentive systems. The moderator of the discussion was a TV personality. This is very nice and very interesting. But would you please express yourself on the following? In the last issue of uh, the report of Stiftung Warentest, the consumer testing agency, your bank came out very badly concerning uh, portfolio advice. In particular, you did not keep the minutes of the discussion the way it was demanded by the law. So then there was a 15-minute discussion on what can they be expected to do when a 70-year-old lady wants to invest 5,000 euros and spends an hour uh, in this discussion. Much more interesting than talking about leverage and the system impact of leverage. Academia. Quite a number of academics have been against raising equity requirements. In particular, those who had 
made some of their reputation on the basis of papers explaining or discussing, we see banks funding with a lot of short-term debt. Why is that efficient? A research program of explaining what we see as being efficient has an inherent bias. And I already mentioned that you don't want to talk about liquidity and resolution if that raises political risks. So what are the actual issues for reform? We need to distinguish between dealing with banks in difficulties and preventing the banks from getting into difficulties in the first place. In dealing with banks in difficulties, most officials that I've seen prefer to kick the can down the road. And I've been in many discussions at the European Systemic Risk Board, where implicitly this was an issue. <laughs> Most of the officials uh, involved would say, let's shut our eyes and hope that things will improve. The one exception of the Swedes, the Swedes in 92 took over the banking system, sort of very Protestant Puritan, outrage in the population, let's get these guys, take over the banking system, clean the stuff up, and reprivatize. Very painful. The worst recession since the, th the 30s. But if you talk to Swedes, they say, we're so happy we did it, we did it that way. And uh, in international discussions on these international bodies, they are the biggest hawks on the subject. Uh, officials in this country think that kicking the can down the road uh, is better. We need procedures for recovery and resolution that minimize systemic fallout. We also need to think, and this is a challenge which politicians usually don't like, to have exit by winding banks down. In some markets, the problem was actually that there was excess capacity. Like uh, Hupo Real Estate, which I mentioned, similarly for Dexia in France, were in, well, Hupo Real Estate still is, in covered bond finance. They fund themselves by issuing covered bonds, and they use their funding to fund governments and real estate mortgages. So government debt and real estate mortgages are the collateral for the uh, covered bonds. Now there's a requirement of having an excess of collateral over the nominal value of the covered bond as a protection to the bondholders. To fund that, you need some unsecured funding. What do you use for unsecured funding? Well, in principle, one would think something with similarly long maturities. But in this segment of the market, competition was actually so tough that you could only survive if you had a maximum of maturity transformation. For institutions like Commerzbank with Eurohypo, they just use their customers' deposits. Hooper Real Estate and Dexia did not have access to significant customer deposits. So how did they do it? They went to the money market. Overnight loans from the money market in order to fund a triple-digit billion number of long-term investments. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have survived. This is why before I said it would make sense to reduce capacity in that market uh, and have someone to exit. But the more general point is that if we think about dealing with banks in difficulties, we need to think not just about uh, bailing them out, but also uh, about what are the effects on market structure. And the many bailouts that we've had have, pre have prevented exit. 
On the issue of side of prevention, there is an issue of funding, there is an issue of asset management, structure, and then shadow banking. So, where are we on the prevention? We've had significant improvements, but too big to fail is still with us. Why? There are three unresolved issues. First, for a bank that's operating in several countries and has systemically important operations in all these countries, there's no way to prevent systemic fallout from resolution. Why? Because in each legally independent subsidiary, you'll have the authority of that country, the country where the subsidiary is located, that's taking over. So in the case of Lehman Brothers, you had US authorities taking over in New York, and you had UK authorities taking over in London. Now, many of these, most of these legally independent uh, institutions, in fact, are integrated in terms of their operations. In the case of Lehman Brothers, you had integrated cash management. You want to economize on cash? So at the close of business in London, you send the cash to New York, and at the close of business in New York, you send it to Asia and then back to London. Lehman Brothers London was an important market maker in many derivatives. So if you want to minimize systemic fallout, you'd like to wind down that particular function slowly. Well, that need, needs resources. When the UK authorities entered the bank, there was no cash there. So they stopped everything immediately. Uh, as yet, that problem is with us because we do not have any cross-border uh, agreements that would provide for single entry resolution. Problems even worse, I'm told, for IT systems. These institutions use integrated IT systems, one for the entire organization. And if you split them up, there is a question on what contractual basis and in what organizational mode are they going to maintain those IT systems? Funding liquidity, even a nationally important bank like Commerzbank, would need ongoing funding. The European le legislation is based on the following picture of how you do the procedure. On Friday night, the authority comes in. On Saturday, they value the assets. Anyone who knows uh, the complexity of Lehman Brothers will just laugh at uh, this idea that you can use a day to value what the assets are worth. On the Sunday, you tell the institution's creditors, uh, either you're written down or for the ones uh, that are just at the margin, you're now shareholders. On the Monday, so on Sunday night, the institution is solvent, and on the Monday, it goes back into the market, and the market treats it as if there were no further problems. That's the picture that the legislator had of how a resolution procedure occurs. Of course, if you know the complexity of these institutions, you know that these things don't work that way, and you also know that if the market is not assured that the problems that have caused the difficulties in the first place have been removed, they'll be suspicious. So for the money market funds that provide the wholesale overnight funding, there are two possibilities to, be, to, to deal with them. One, you do what is done with non-financial companies in bankruptcy, you freeze their claims. Now that's a systemic disaster because then you get a run on money market funds, as we had following uh, Lehman Brothers. 
And that can do enormous harm for, to the financial system. So you don't freeze their claims. And then how do you keep them continuing funding the bank? You need guarantees. But as I mentioned, the problem of ensuring persistent funding is not even mentioned. The word liquidity is not even mentioned in any of the legislation. Final point, the rules on which creditors will be made liable can be made to bear losses and which ones are exempt may give rise to the possibility that in the end there is a gap and one needs fiscal backstops. Fiscal backstops are not being discussed. So uh, my conclusion is that for big cross-border banks, such as Deutsche, Barclays, BNP Paribas, or J.P. Morgan Chase, these procedures will never be applied. And we're back to square one. For big nationally relevant banks, they might be applied, but only if the funding problem is solved. For small banks, they will be applied. Uh, this after four years of legislative effort. Prevention. The discussion about structure is based on the notion that in the 50s and 60s, the system in the US was safe. And this was when we had the Glass-Steagall Act providing for the separation of commercial banking, depository institutions, and investment banking, and securities houses also based on the notion that the taxpayer is only uh, there to help depositors and that investment banking is really risky, whereas traditional banking is not. Most of that is just nonsense. Uh, the separ separation of <coughs> banking under Glass-Steagall was a major factor in the banking crisis in the US in the 1980s. And Last Eagle was removed because it could no longer be maintained. Traditional banking is risky. And if you go back uh, over time, the biggest losses have occurred from lending on real estates and lending to firms. The various crises of the early 90s have all had to do with that. Traditional banks are exposed to significant risks, risks of default, risks of maturity transformation, and risks from liquidity provision. And then we've had all these non-traditional banks, long-term capital management in 98, Lehman Brothers, Hippo Real Estate. None of them had deposits, and yet they needed to be bailed out. This discussion is one example where there has been no analysis. What should be the analysis? Well, it would fo fo focus on governance, on contagion, and on resolution. What do I mean by that? A key issue in the crisis, we have high surplus funds arising in some places that are given elsewhere for real investment. What governance do we have for that procedure? Well, one thing to observe is that all the systems of governance that we have have failed. We had an arm's length system, say, in relations between depositors, money market funds, and Lehman Brothers. Not a success story. You had corporate integration, Swiss depositors, UBS, and UBS Investment Bank. Not a success story. You ha have the hybrid in between German savings banks and the Landesbank, and even worse. So what's a good system of governance that would avoid the many issues of moral hazard and lack of attention that we've had there? Contagion. Is it better? to have contagion through domino effects of, through contracts? Or is it better to have contagion 
through in-house relations? We have no idea. Resolution. Let me be provocative. Why do we actually allow these big cross-border banks with systemically important operations in different countries at all? Why must Deutsche Bank have an investment bank in New York? Are the efficiency benefits from such corporate structures worth the costs that arise from these institutions being too big to fail, being irresolvable? I think those are the issues that we should actually discuss. Liquidity coverage ratio. I was saying before, cash is always liquid. What else? Cash doesn't earn a return. Government debt, <coughs> such as in Greece. We heard this before. Covered bonds. The Danes have always used covered bonds for liquidity. At that point, you have the American banks saying, it's unfair. The Europeans have covered bonds and are allowed to use that against the liquidity coverage ratio. We don't have covered bonds. We only have mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities. Fairness requires that asset-backed securities must also count against this requirement. And this is what we've got. Remember August 2007? From one day to the next, the markets for these mortgage-backed securities disappeared, and these instruments were completely illiquid. And even before that, it's questionable whether they ever were liquid, because uh, there weren't many transactions then. Uh, but this is what we've got. And this is sort of the political dynamic of the anything but cash discussion comparable to the anything but equity discussion that we had in um, other contexts. The politics of this is simply liquidity requirements to use asset returns, and then there's a temptation to make exceptions, and to fool oneself about what these exceptions mean. What should be the issues? Why is wholesale so important? 20 years ago, it wasn't. Why are money market funds so important? Money market funds are a result of regulatory arbitrage, developed in the 70s in order to overcome, to get around interest rate regulation of depository institutions, and in order to provide American investment banks with the funding source that was like deposits, but went around the prohibition of deposit taking for investment banks. They're still a result of regulatory arbitrage because they don't have deposit insurance. Mind you, on the Friday after Lehman Brothers, the run on money market funds, which had occurred during the week, was stopped by the US Treasuries announcing we're offering money market funds a scheme that's like deposit insurance. So first, you save on the fees, and afterwards, you get the protection anyway. We haven't had much of a reform of money market funds. The use of repo contracts, repurchase contracts, uh, is basically a way of arbitraging around bankruptcy law. The externalities on incumbent other creditors have never been considered. But the issue of the most important issue, why is wholesale so important? And to what extent is that a matter of economic efficiency as opposed to uh, regulatory arbitrage? That issue has not been discussed. Shadow banking. It's a catch-all phrase which politicians love, but use to not do the things they ought to be doing. You go after hedge funds, part of the shadow banking system, but hedge funds have not been much of a problem. 
the banks lending to hedge funds typically insist that they must have 30% or more equity. The major problems that we've had from the shadow banking system have been special purpose vehicles of regulated banks, regulatory arbitrage that was tolerated by the supervisors. Some of that has improved, but I'm not even sure whether the changes in legislative norms have been implemented by the supervisory authorities. And then you have the money market funds. I talked about that before. So uh, the main vehicle for improving prevention would, of course, uh, in my view, be uh, improved equity requirements, not like Basel III, but something uh, much more substantial. And I would like to uh, emphasize that this is not just a question of reducing the risk that the bank might go under. It's also a question of reducing systemic risk, in particular, the risk from fire sale contagion. Multipliers for deleveraging are much smaller if you have more equity. What's the idea? Suppose equity funding, e equity is about 2% of a bank's assets. The bank makes a loss of 1%. That wipes out 50% of the equity. To re-establish the 2% base show, the bank needs to sell 50% of its assets. That's a huge multiplier. At higher equity ratios, the multiplier would be much smaller. I've already discussed that the 20-year period following 1990 has induced a, a very large change in equity. Actually, pre-1995, equity was a question of, uh, what? oh, okay, fine. Equity was a question of how many hidden reserves do we re reveal? How much do we have to put on our balance sheet and how much can we have by way of hidden reserves? The crisis of the early 90s wiped out most of those hidden reserves. And also, banks' incentives became different. They wanted to show whatever equity they had and then do a lot of borrowing uh, on top of that. Now, one interesting feature about the discussion on equity is the behavior of the academic community. And there have been two parts of the academic community that have actually, actually been, been very critical of the notion that equity requirements might be a good idea. One, the Squamlake report, written by 15 leading uh, finance experts, do not ask for more equity because that might harm discipline. Doug Diamond and Raghu Rajan were participants, and I assume that this must have come from them. Uh, they had written papers in uh, around 2000 explaining the use of demand deposits, stuff that can be withdrawn at will, with the purpose of imposing discipline on management. What's the idea? Well, these depositors are always watching. And the moment they see the manager misbehaving, they withdraw their funds. And because the manager knows that they're misbehaving, he, that they're always watching, he never misbehaves. Once you understand the pattern, you wonder why this would be limited to banks. But uh, so in one paper, the manager resists the temptation to be soft with the bank's own loan customers. In another paper, he resists the notion of awarding himself too high a salary. Actually, I'm surprised that there aren't more, more papers because there are certainly more sources of moral hazard that could be dealt with by that argument. But that's basically the Squam Lake report. The other line of argument is Gorton and his co-authors, most recently, well, 
uh, and a different paper by D'Angelo and Stoltz uh, recently. One of the purposes of banks is to provide the economy with liquid debt. Banks produce liquid debt. What does that mean? Well, debt is liquid because debt does not depend on information. Whereas the returns to shares depend on the returns to the bank, that's very information sensitive. How much your share is worth depends on what the bank is making. With debt, you know what you're owed and you don't have a worry in heaven. And this is what banks must produce. We all love our deposits and we all love the payment system. So, both of these lines of argument have been critical of equity. Two observations. First, even though they get to the same conclusion, conceptually they're inconsistent with each other. In Diamond Rajan, share, uh, depositors are always looking. What are these guys doing? In Gordon et al., they don't have a worry and never look because information doesn't matter. There is a third explanation, which would be debt overhang. If I am already in, indebted, additional borrowing, in particular, additional borrowing at short maturity. The short maturity will preempt the seniority of incumbent debt holders, and I can make them worse off, imposing additional bankruptcy risk on them. Now, we have three explanations. I tend to believe the last one, but um, for your program of thinking about what does academia do with the real world, it would be an interesting question why, have, why don't we have empirical research that puts these three explanations into a horse face? So in 2010, I uh, was drafted into writing a paper on the discussion about equity entitled Fallacies, Irrelevant Facts and Myths. Fallacies, that's outright nonsense. And there's a lot of outright nonsense, such as the British Bankers Association claiming Basel III will require British banks to have 700 billion more in equity. That means 700 billion less in lending to the real economy. Not making the distinction between cash, which is an asset, and equity, uh, which is a funding way. Irrelevant facts, confusions between private and social costs. Key elements of uh, bankers' preference for equity have to do with externalities on creditors, on taxpayers. Finally, myths, theoretical models that have never been compared to real-world experience. So, uh, since it's much more boring to see a speaker fully clothed, uh, here is a more interesting attire uh, that you might want to look at. On that mode, I want to close a discussion about additional equity requirements uh, is sort of one of the most strange discussions that I've ev I have ever seen in uh, a policy context. So. Okay, normally I'm very good at restricting speakers. Uh, today I have a little bit more trouble. But um, so uh, uh, Hans Werner Sinn will be available for discussion later in the discussion round because many people ask me uh, about that possibility. And as uh, Martin Helwig has to leave uh, soon, maybe we have one, two questions now, I suggest. So are there remarks or comments? Sander? Um, yes, thanks very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I would like to ask you a question about um, the complexity of regulation, so the fine-tuning argument. Um, this to me seems, um, so how can we simplify regulation? It seems related to the question of regulatory capture, because the whole discussion in Basel is about fine-tuning the capital ratios and uh, 
Um, so, so how do you think we can resolve this regulatory capture problem, basically? Uh, that's actually one reason why we much prefer a leverage ratio uh, without risk weighting, partly because we think the risk weighting uh, is not to be taken very seriously. Uh, partly also, I mean, very high equity requirement because we think that the regulator getting involved in fine, so in details of asset management, of also of structural decisions, usually he doesn't know what he's doing. Whereas equity just means you improve liability of the organization's owners and managers. Now we're told, but if we do a simple leverage ratio requirement, we can always design contracts that allow very strange forms of risk taking. So I wouldn't mind going above the minimum, but not going below. Uh, and I think that would already uh, provide significant help. On the side of how do we avoid the capture, here we get back to the point what would the regulators do? Banks are where the money is. Uh, so one effect that we've had in the euro area has been in the periphery countries, weak banks have been kept alive because ECB lending to weak banks, weak bank lending to governments, gave the governments indirect access to the printing press in terms of orders of magnitude actually much bigger than what we've uh, seen explicitly in things like uh, the S&P. Uh, I have some hope that this side of capture may be somewhat reduced by the single supervisory mechanism, at least for a while. I have no illusions about capture returning as of 10 years from now. In terms of shaping the regulations, I mean, I've seen this at the ESRB. It's all about our banks and our governments. A week ago, uh, the ESRB published a, a report on the regulatory treatment of sovereign exposures. It's the first official report by any institution on the subject. Getting that report done was very much an uphill battle. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Uh, yeah, then uh, because you need to take your, uh, the driver is already waiting, so let's thank uh, Martin Helwig again and uh, 